You know that I am preaching a series of messages called Backstories. So what we're doing is that we're looking at all of these well-known uh, Bible characters and we're thinking about parts of their story that maybe you didn't know or maybe you didn't know as well as the main story. Like for instance, today I'm preaching on Joshua. And I am sure that if I uh, were to say to you, what is the story of Joshua? You probably would say, well, um, it was Moses um, who led the children um, out of Egyptian bondage. But it was Joshua that God called upon to lead them into the promised land. Now, you probably already know that. But I'm going to talk about some backstory here that I think you're going to find really interesting. At least I do. So we're looking at Joshua chapter 1, and we're looking at the first 11 verses. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to who? Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Okay, you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Moses is dead. God has spoken to Joshua. Um, Moses, um, because of some disobedience, not just on him, but all the people of God were disobedient. Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage but is not going to be able to see with his own eyes the promised land. Joshua, I need you to lead the people. Every place that stole, uh, excuse me, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward uh, the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now, he gave him a big task. and He said, the main thing I want you to remember and never forget is that I'm going to be with you. As impossible as this sounds right now, you have a promise from me, I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and be very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe it according to all that is written in it. And then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Can be someone God. say, thanks be unto God? Thanks be unto God. Amen. Well, uh, this morning, um, I want to share with you just some brief thoughts uh, concerning uh, this back, the backstory of Joshua. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles again uh, to the, uh, Exodus 1, and we're going to start reading at verse 7, and we're going to go to verse 14. While you're turning to Exodus chapter 1 and Exodus chapter 3. We're going to take a look at both. 
uh, we're going to see some of Joshua's backstory. And this is important that you understand this backstory. Let's go to Exodus 1. Uh, let's go 11 through 14. Joshua, like the rest of us, has a backstory. Um, Joshua grew up in slavery. Did you know that? Did you know that he grew up in slavery? Sometimes we just think that Joshua just somehow appeared <laughs> as, as, uh, as uh, Moses' assistant. Not at all. He was, uh, uh, grew up in exile. He grew up in, um, with great suffering, backbreaking work. He grew up with disappoint, uh, disappointment and disillusionment. And uh, that, that was how this young man grew up. That was what his family life was like. Exodus, let's go one, Exodus one, and let's look at verses uh, uh, 11 through 14, first of all. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Isn't that interesting? And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So that the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service to the field, in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. It was very, very, very hard. Now, never forget that that's a part of Joshua's backstory. From the time he was a child, for the rest of his life, that is what he would remember. So, Imagine with me how discouraged Joshua families and tens of thousands of other families uh, must have felt. The disappointment they must have known. But at the end of each day, <laughs> this is what we must never forget, and this is an important part of Joshua's story. At the end of each day, here's what the families would do. They were exhausted. They were hungry, they were poorly dressed, they did not have decent places to live. At the end of each day, families would gather and they would pray and they would try to be an encouragement to each other. Turn with me to Exodus chapter three, verses seven through 10. And here we are given a hint at what their prayers were like and how God answered their prayers. This is Exodus 3 and 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries. So this is not what, this was not casual praying these families were, in, were entering into. As they prayed, they wept. They cried out to God because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, God said. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. See, there was two parts of the deliverance, right? Delivered them out from slavery and delivered them into the promised land, into Canaan, okay? So it was Moses who led them in the first deliverance, and it was Joshua who led them in the second deliverance, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, Amorites and the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, 
and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So that's a really, really important part of Joshua's backstory. I need you to understand that. Um, his whole life was preparation for that second deliverance. And uh, it was, my dad used to say, the school of hard knocks. <laughs> that was not your typical rabbinic teaching. That was the school of hard knocks. But that was an important part of his preparation because he had a really tough assignment ahead of him. Of course, Moses led them out of the Egyptian bondage. But it was Joshua who led them, who led them into the promised land. The book of Joshua is primarily about the challenges that were associated uh, with this holy occupation of Canaan. And from this, we see clearly what is needed to be done, that we need the things of God and we must be willing to obey his commands if we are going to receive this uh, second deliverance. So as you look at Joshua 1.9, which is a, a very, very well-known passage, could someone just read Joshua 1.9 for us? Just read it out loud quickly. Very well known verse. I have commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't tremble or be terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wow. Man. Uh, Sally reminded me, and I guess I had forgotten this, one of the things that Sally inherited from her grandparents' estate uh, was a mirror that has that printed on it. And that hangs where now in our house? I forget. It's in my room. It's in your room. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but there's three, there's three ideas there, and if I were preaching out of this verse alone, there is, there is three ideas there I would be reflecting on. Promise, courage, and presence. We've received the promise, we will be given courage, and we will have his presence. That would be a great sermon, wouldn't it? Would that be for another time? Because that's not what I'm going to preach about this morning. Here's how I want to preach. And I want to share with you basically what I shared with uh, uh, the good people at Makunji this morning. Um, so, <clears throat> many of you know the story of the Allentown Church of the Nazarene. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with this story. There were a group of courageous people a long time ago. I can only guess when that church started. It had to be at least 75 years ago, maybe even 100 years ago. I don't know, but it was a long time ago. There were a group of people that were led by uh, a Moses-type pastor out of the out from among them and a church was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And that church had a long and glorious history just as this church has had a long and glorious history and just as, for instance, Reading Church, a long and glorious history I'm not to get into all the reasons why the Allentown Church no longer exists. Um, it, it's complicated, and it's hard to talk about. Yeah. And I also know that there's been a reduction um, in our church in terms of the number of people who attend here. And I think it's something we need to be concerned about. It is. It is something we need to be concerned about. Um, but this is not a sermon about being concerned. This is a sermon about being courageous. And so we announced this morning, 
at the uh, Makanji Church of the Nazarene, which about half the congregation is made up of folks who were part of the Amtown Church. It's about half. Um, it's, a, it's a group of people that are sad. It's a group of people, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating when I'm saying it's a group of people who are grieving the loss of that church. How long did you guys attend that church? Um, when I first moved here from my, my wife, I moved here in 93. You know, I've been in that church, you know, we left, I was there, with my wife and I got buried in that church under Pastor Aki. Right, so you've been there since basically the early 90s. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at 30 years. That, you, that, that church was a part of your life. Yep. You were married there. You made commitments to the Lord there. And so we can understand um, the grief. Can we not? They understand the grief associated with the loss of that church. Um, the Reddick Church is a whole different kind of story. Uh, but there's grief associated when we lose something that was very near and dear to us. Amen? Amen. Isn't Amen. that fair to say? Amen. Well, there's one thing we can do. We can either um, we can either sit around in a perpetual state of grief, or we can take courage and do something. I happen to be a big proponent of the latter. Grieving is appropriate. That's why we have funerals. Funerals are a chance for us to grieve. And I heard Brennan Manning once say that when we come to church on Sunday morning, there is to, both, to be both celebration and grief every time we worship. Because when, when we pray, we're grieving certain losses, aren't we? Look around this room. We've all lost something, and we've all lost someone. And so it's appropriate for us to grieve, grieve. But I'm here to say, I'm not sure it's appropriate for us to remain in a perpetual state of grief. I think we're to take courage and prepare ourselves and, and to be obedient for God's next thing. And so we announced this morning, and I know you'll want to hear this because the McCunchy Church and the Allentown Church our sister churches to us here in the Lehigh Valley. You do understand that we are missionally connected. We're all Nazarenes. And so we're in this thing together. And we announced that we're going back to Allentown. I'm serious. We're going back. But it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be the traditional track of buying a building and going into debt and spending a lot of money to build a building, and we're not going to go that route. We're not going to go the route of uh, maybe calling a full-time pastor and having a lot of programs that uh, would be great to have, but we frankly don't have the people to do those programs. Just like here, we really don't have the people at this time to do a children's program or do a youth program or do a program that is geared to reach college students. We're waiting, we're praying, but that may or may not be what God has for us here. We don't know. We're still praying and waiting for God to show up and tell us. Well, you're going to love this story. There is a young lady who now has her local minister's license and who was in the course of study that just three years ago was rather hopelessly addicted to drugs and alcohol. By her own admission this morning, um, she was addicted. God delivered her. God redeemed her. God saved her. She is a third or fourth generation Allentown Nazarene. And God has called her to do ministry. Now listen to this. Not only is that incredible, she has a burden on her heart to reach the homeless population of Allentown. So here's what we're going to do. Would you like to know what we're going to do? Huh? We're going to spend a ton of money and buy a building? Absolutely not. You know what we're going to do? We're going to buy a bus. And we're going to take the seats out of it. So it's not going to be your typical bus ministry. It's going to be a chapel on wheels. And we're going to start downtown with a 
ministry, a congregation of holiness, of holy, of homeless people. A congregation of hom homeless people. That's how we're going to start. You say, well, Pastor, what is that a real congregation? Sally, inside my bag is that magazine. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that real quick, I've got to bring it up with me. I've got a great memory, except that it's just real short. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so here, here, here's, I want you to read some things that the general superintendents not only said this, but this was printed um, for all to see. In the Church of the Nazarene, our definition as a church reads, now again, remember, this is from our Board of General Superintendents. Any group that meets regularly for spiritual nurture, worship, or instruction at an announced time and an announced place with an identified leader and aligned with the message and mission of the Church of the Nazarene may be recognized as a church and reported as such for district and general church statistics. In other words, a church is a cluster of believers. It is not a building, and it is not a property. Amen. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. And I love my church. I have such respect for that. Because that's biblical, folks. Yeah. That's biblical. I'm afraid sometimes we, we have found ourselves with a limited view of what the church is because of our um, need for buildings. And that's especially true in North America. Now, Nazarene churches, other parts of the world, they are not restricted by such things. Most of the Nazarene churches that are starting in Africa, by the way, it's the fastest growing continent in the Church of the Nazarene in the world. You know how many buildings? They're meeting under trees. They're meeting in people's homes. And it's the fastest growing part of the Church of the Nazarene in the world. And check it out. Many of them are being pastored by lay pastors. I'm praying for and hoping for a revolution in the Church of the Nazarene of lay pastors. I'm really hoping because I think that's the only way that we're going to see a church uh, that looks like what we've just described. Because if we're waiting on people to go to seminary and get degrees and become a clergy person and then ordained, if we're waiting, that's just, just there were four people ordained this year on the Philadelphia district. Four. And you may go, man, that's pretty good. Well, it's pretty good in terms of, you know, providing pastors for our established attractional churches. But if we're going to be missional, we've got to have 10 times that many people receiving lay minister's licenses every year. Now, what would happen if we had 40 people on the Philadelphia district that got lay minister's licenses next year and went out and started organic churches like the one I've just described. The Church of the Nazarene would absolutely explode in North America. I'm just excited to be a part of that. So check this out. It's going to cost us $25,000. $25,000. What? What is that for her salary? No. She's not going to take any salary. She's got a job. She's got a really good job. Right? Secondly, that is for what the bus is going to cost us. Now, it's not the bus is going to cost us $25,000. Actually, we're hoping somebody will just give us a bus. So if you have a bus and you want to give it to us, thank you. We'll take it. It would be great if it ran. <laughs> but it doesn't have to run much. It just has to run from the McCunchy parking lot to the city and then back. That's it. Right? But so where's that? Well, we're going to put a sound system in there 
and we're going to put a, a, a you know, eventually there, we're going to have a, a, a children's congregation that's going to be meeting in there. So we're going to have puppet platforms and stages and a variety of things like that. And then we're going to have a teen um, congregation that's going to develop there. We might have to move it. Now, see, that's the beautiful thing about a bus. If it's got wheels, we can roll it someplace else and have another, have a, have a church there and then roll it someplace else and have a church there. And then somebody raised their hand and said, why, we, why can't we have a hundred of those buses? And I went, absolutely. And it's not going to be long, I believe, that all of those congregations combined are going to be larger than the Makanji Church. telling you, these are exciting days. I thought you'd like to know that. You know, not because I'm expecting you to give to it. I mean, you can if you want to. And that would be great. Just, you know, you can give me a check that says Allen, Allentown, the Allentown Project. Isn't that creative? That's what we're calling it. The Allentown Project. So yeah, if you want to give a couple of bucks to that, that's fine, but that's not why I'm asking you. I'm asking you to pray. And I'm asking you if the Lord should lay it upon your heart, come to me and ask me for a lay minister's license so that you can go out and do the same. It could be in your home. It could be a Starbucks, for those of you who like Starbucks. Not a big fan. I'm going to tell you a quick story. My, my father, once I went into Starbucks and I came back out, he said, buddy, how much did you pay for that? I said, well, about $5. And my dad said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but I'm telling you, that's where people gather. Oh, how about this idea? Instead of saying, hey, y'all come to us. That's a tractional church. And we're going to continue to do that. Why? Because Jesus said, come unto me and all you that are weary and and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Jesus was attractional. Amen? He attracted people unto himself, and I think the church should try to attract people. I really do. So we're not dropping that. But Jesus also said, go. So it's not so much as starting another church over there. Listen to this. This is so cool. It's being the church and taking the church to them. Now, see, I think that's the new way of doing church in the 21st century. I really do. And I can't wait to be a part of it. You know, I've been doing ministry for almost 50 years. And I've been involved in the attractional church thing. And actually, I led some great churches. When I was in York, Pennsylvania, I led a church. It was an attractional church. I led a church from 400 to about 1,700 in 15 years. Listen to me. You see, that was all attractional. That was all jamming 1,700 people in, in, a, in one room. Absolutely not. We had 13 satellites all over the city, all out in the country. We had, we were, a, a, we, those were little churches within the church, and we called it Snow Meadow. So I've been doing this for 30 years. This is no new idea with me. In fact, it's not a new idea at all. First century. Look at the first century. We didn't even have church buildings. What for? What the first three centuries of our existence? We were in people's homes. I mean, read Paul's letter. Greetings to the saints in Colossus and to the folks that meet in Bob's house. I mean, it was something like that. But I'm saying it met in people's homes. It's time for us to return to the first century, isn't it? Now, I feel really good about how hard we have worked to renovate this, this, this building. Uh, I, I, I gotta tell you, you are to be commended for your faithfulness. I mean it. It sounds like a little thing, but the new flooring and the new paint and then that handicapped accessible bathroom, have you had a chance to try it yet? <laughs> I'd say these are not small things because we're gonna continue to try to practice a fractional church. But let me tell you about a congregation that's forming across the street. This is so much fun, isn't it? 
we have the common table and I think it's a really cool thing. I hope that if you don't pick up things for yourself, and we really do hope that you'll pick up things for yourself because it's not lost on me. For those of you who are living on a fixed income, this is no small deal. Being able to pick up some food, that's extremely helpful, isn't it? So please feel free to do that. But I want to encourage you to also put a bag together and take it to somebody in your neighborhood that's in need. Maybe some senior adult that finds it difficult to get out and get shopping. That's what Jesus would do. So feel free. That's why it's there. We're partnering with an organization called uh, Blessings of Hope out of Lancaster. I hope that you'll take the time to go online and learn about them. It's an incredible ministry. You know the food that was purchased back there? It was purchased for 25 cents a pound. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So all that to say this, we have lived across the street from that, um, what you call it, that home, that group home across the street. And uh, raise your hand if you, if you feel like maybe the Lord is leading you to start a congregation there. Raise your hand. Look, folks. These kids are going to be getting lay ministers' licenses real soon. And they're not only carrying food across the street, they're taking the name of Jesus with them. So here's how we pray. Pray that the food will just serve as an open door for them to get to know the residents, to pray with them, to share some scripture with them, maybe even sing Jesus Loves Me with them. He said, does that make it a congregation? All right, let me think. Six Ps. You need a place, check. You need people, check. You need pastor, or in this case, lay pastors, check. Where there is praise, check. Proclamation, check. And uh, proclamation, so sharing the word and prayer. The six Ps, right? Say, Pastor, but is this a new idea? Did you know that we have a pastor in Poxitani, Pennsylvania? He has received a lay minister's license uh, from this church. And he has an online ministry where he has 13 regular people that he preaches to online. Plus, he had two conversions through his ministry last year. Two people saved through his ministry. That wasn't just him, that was us. That was us. That was a Bethel church. Isn't that cool? And now, um, probably starting Christmas Eve, he's going to start a worship service um, at, uh, um, at a high-rise apartment in his town made up of um, people of all ages and ethnicities and they've got a, a community room there and they are begging him to come and lead a worship service on Sunday. And what's that going to be when they gather? It's going to be a Bethel church. Why not? There is this incredible and I was reminded of this this morning I had a person walk up to me and say, Pastor Bud, remember what Jesus said about new wine and old wineskins? Yeah. What do you mean by that? I think I knew, but I wanted to hear from them. Well, it could be that God has something new that he wants to do. The new wine, but the old wineskins maybe can't contain it. Maybe, just maybe, this whole idea of going out and starting congregation is a new wineskin. Man, where were you when I was preparing this sermon? That's great. So I'm not saying that this older wineskin here is done. I'm not saying that at all. I, I think we need to be faithful in inviting people to come into worship. Amen. But we've just added two new wineskins. For the Holy Spirit 
to use and pour out something new. You think God loves those individuals across the street who live, who are mentally, um, you know, maybe challenged? Is that the politically correct way to say it? I hope so. Mm -hmm. I want to say it right. Do you think they need Jesus? Do you think they're able to understand that God loves them? You think they're able to understand that Jesus can save them from their sins? Of course they are. This is our mission field, and we're sending our missionaries there. Are you in? Maybe when it means, are you in, it's a matter of being faithful and attending here and praying and giving. Maybe that's what it means to be in. But I don't want to close the door. If the Lord is tugging on your heartstrings, I'll give you a lay minister's license in a heartbeat. Craig has one. I don't know exactly what he's going to do with it in the days ahead. I have no idea where he's going to go or how he's going to use it. But never forget this. You are a lay pastor at the Kutztown Bethel Church of the Nazarene until the day you tell us you're not. Amen? Amen. That's why I can't, I can't get too uptight about Craig leaving. We're going to miss him. But he's a missionary. He, he's going to do God's work wherever he is. So if it looks like I'm not sad enough, well, I am sad. I'm, I'm going to miss him being here on Sunday morning. And we greatly appreciate what he has done. But God's up to something new. And Craig is offering God a new wineskin for him to pour out his spirit in a new way. Amen. So how about them apples? Amen. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? I want to be a part of it. Don't you? Now we're going to pray. Lord, thank you so much. I think about this young lady who stood before the church just three and a half years ago. She couldn't have done this. But here she is. Clean and sober and called of God to minister to the homeless population of Allentown. What a cool thing it was to see that whole congregation, every last person at Makanji this morning, gather around her and lay hands on her. And when these young people receive their lay minister's licenses, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna gather around them and lay hands on them and commission them. In the meantime, we're praying for this group home that they'll continue to be receptive to us. We're giving you permission, Lord, to kick us out of the church, the four walls of the church, into a world that desperately needs you. And we're excited to be a part of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.